geologic time is divided into um, eons. Present day uh, is part of the Phanerozoic eon. And that goes back 452 or 542 million years. And um, <clears throat> that Phanerozoic is then split into three eras. Paleozoic era from 542 million years ago to 251 million years ago. And then the Mesozoic um, era, which uh, went from 251 million to 66 million years ago. And then the Cenozoic era um, up until the present. Um, there's fossils in all of these um, eras. And the Phanerozoic basically started at what we call the Cambrian Explosion, which was when um, life on Earth uh, and the variety of life just exploded. And we see that in the rock record. Below the Phanerozoic is what's called the Proterozoic. And that's when we, where we find the oldest fossils of multicelled organism. Um, and what's interesting is that's also before that is when oxygen bank began to accumulate in the atmosphere and we started to get um, more enough oxygen in the atmosphere that it could support um, multi-celled life on the earth. But before that in the Archaean eon we did have life. It was bacteria and one of the things God did during that time was put um, types of life on earth that would help build oxygen and um, help um, create an atmosphere that was breathable. Um, Proterozoic um, is earlier, earlier life then and Phanerozoic then is life revealed. Um, the explosion of organisms with hard skeletons took place at the beginning of the Cambrian why did that matter? Well, hard parts are easily preserved as fossils. So at the Cambrian, we started to see lots of fossils. If we look at a big picture of geologic time, uh, we can look at a time scale between 0 and 5 billion years, Earth being about 4.6 billion years old. And which letter corresponds most closely to the first appearance in the rock record of abundant fossils? In other words, the Cambrian explosion, and conveniently that is letter C. Um, letter D might um, apply to the um, first appearance of single-cell um, bacteria and uh, or um, bacteria that would help put oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, so then which letter corresponds most closely to the extinction of dinosaurs would have happened after the Cambrian explosion? And that would be B. Then A might apply to something like, um, it looks like it's quite a ways before now, so maybe it would be uh, when, um, when God had created, the, say, the mastodons or mammoths, something like that. One in interesting thing to think about is that um, even though all major phyla were created by the Cambrian, um, most all species on Earth have gone extinct, and God's created new species over time. Uh, it, the diversity of organizations has increased through time, so we have many more species now than we did it, um, er, earlier in Earth history. And it's also it's also interesting to think that all the major phyla were created by the Cambrian. That, um, that basically the model or the kinds of animals or and plant that were, were created at that time. So how would an extinction affect biodiversity? Well, biodiversity decreases after a major extinction event. In a major extinction of them, a number of them happen over geologic time. Now this is an important graph to think about and kind of spend some time looking at. Uh, this is from the Cambrian explosion to today, going from left to right. 
and then it's the number of uh, genre in um, in uh, that exist from the Cambrian until today. And notice that there's um, five times more genre of um, animals and plants today than there were uh, 500 million years ago. And so also as we look at this, there's five mass extinctions that have taken place through time. Uh, one was between just at the end of the Ordovician, 450 million years ago. Notice that blue triangle. And so there was an increase in um, genre, of an genre of animals and plants, but then suddenly they died off. Same thing happened in Devonian. They died off. Same thing happened at the end of the Permian. There was um, a major loss of diversity, of, of uh, biodiversity at the end of the Permian. Uh, same at the end of the tri Triassic. And then uh, the, the big one that we like to talk about at the end of the Cretaceous when the, when the um, dinosaurs were, were killed off um, and went extinct um, took place um, 50, 65, 66 million, or a million years ago, the last blue triangle on the right. We think each of those conforms to a near-Earth object that hit the Earth, but we're, there's, we're still looking for that evidence. That's a hypothesis at this point. A mass extinction is when large number of species die. Um, from one side of the other to a mass extinction, uh, one type of rock has one type of species and the other type of rock above it has a different type of species. Um, this is a picture of an extinct mastodon, which is a, a cousin um, of the mammoth. Um, so here's some, uh, a couple of the ma major extinctions that I just talked about. One between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary. Um, no dinosaurs except perhaps uh, birds survived the event. Uh, mammals were able to expand and become the dominant group. Why? Um, well, we think because there was no competition but from the dinosaurs and mammals were able to um, start to take over and live in the niches that um, the dinosaurs had originally lived in. I like to think of it in terms of um, God um, you, God, God is an artist changing the uh, um, seasons of the room. When um, in, in in my house, my wife likes to um, change the seasons, and so uh, we have fall decorations, and then those go away, and then we bring, come bring in Christmas decorations, and then those go away, and then we have Valentine's decorations, and those go away, and then we have summer seashell decorations in the house. Well, I think that, I, I like to think that's how God has done things here on earth. There's there's one earth and he and his creativity has um, changed the critters that he's made through the systems that he's set here just because he's chosen that. And in his providential rule, um, he's chosen to do that. And <clears throat> We think that at the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, about 75% of all species were destroyed. Um, the Permian Triassic extinction, uh, much much older than that, killed off about 96% of marine species and 70% of land species. It's often called the Great Dying. Um, Earth science, numerical time. Early methods for determining the age of the Earth were flawed. They yielded age that were ages that were too recent. A couple different tools that, or ideas that were used to measure the age of the Earth were one of salinity of the oceans. In other words, measure how much salt is delivered in the ocean from the continents through streams. 
and then use that to estimate how old the earth is. The flaw with that, it didn't take into account the formation of chemical sedimentary rocks which remove salt from the oceans. Um, and we'll see some pictures of big uh, salt deposits under the under the uh, sediments. Um, um, you, you can go to Kansas and look at salt deposits under Kansas that were put, were put there in ancient oceans. And if you go to the Gulf of Mexico or Angola or many other parts around the world, you can find oil um, trapped under salt deposits. It's a it's a uh, common way to uh, prospect for oil. Um, the other the other numerical time method that didn't work was to look at conductive cooling of the earth in other words knowing the earth's volume and properties of rocks you could calculate how long it would take for the earth to cool from a molten state to a present state the flaw with that is you didn't know about uh, they didn't know about radioactive decay at that point and the contribution of heat in the earth from radio radioactive decay inside the earth nor was the theory of plate tectonics proposed and so the calculations were made assuming heat was diffused uniformly across the Earth's surface, which we know is not true. Earth science, time, and time dilation. I'm including this uh, section on time and time dilation because um, one of the objectives I have in, in students taking this course and one of the objectives um, of taking a course in earth science is to gain a different look at how what time is from a practical standpoint of looking back in earth history. So this is our section on geologic time and earth history and I want us to get a good grasp of what the nature of time is before we um, delve into um, uh, the history of the earth. The scripture tells us that um, God doesn't experience time the same we do um, in your eyes, a thousand years are like yesterday that quickly passes, or like one in the division of the nighttime. Um, when I interpret Genesis with people, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through that some as we get into geologic time, um, I like to ask, well, what rate of time is God moving at? And what is the rate of time for God? Because um, everything in the universe, from a time dilation standpoint, moves at a different rate of time. What is the rate of time of God in eternity? Well, it's kind of a nonsense question because um, God is different than we are. But it does make us think because if we're thinking in terms of, well, how long is a day? Well, God's the observer of a day, and, and you see where I'm going with that. Time's also related to light. Light moves at a constant speed. E equals mc squared. The speed of light is a constant or the equation would not work. Nuclear power plants only operate because of the speed of light is a constant in the formula e equals mc squared. Now why am I mentioning this? Well it's because there are those that would play with the laws of physics in order to try and interpret, uh, come up with why you see geologic evidence supporting a, a young earth 24-hour day and laws of physics just don't support those ideas including the equation e equals mc squared because the speed of light is constant we find objects in space that are much much older than um, than uh, 10,000 light years away and you can't play with the speed of light and mess with the laws of physics by using triangulation from radio telescopes, astronomers measure pulsars in space up to 23,000 light years away, as an example. And a pulsar is an object that that radio array telescopes we've already um, can can see in space. They they give off a, a signal, and by triangulation um, we can see that the light from those took um, up to 23,000 light years to reach our eyes or those the telescopic array on the earth. So let's look at time dilation in detail. How long is the day to God? Well, God exists in eternity. Time is different for God than for us. Time changes rates based on velocity and gravity for those living in the universe. 
So velocity and gravity based um, are um, the basis for time dilation. Different velocities, different how long is a day to us humans on the Earth's surface? Well, it's 24 hours long at the surface of the Earth. Um, however, shuttle astronauts in going around the uh, around the Earth would have a little bit different time rate than we would. You know, basically 24 hours, but it would not be exactly 24 hours because they're moving at a different velocity and gravity than we are. Um, an example I I I like to show is from a friend, a physics physicist friend of mine in Seattle and he he ran three cesium clocks and took his kids up Mount Rainier over a weekend and kept them running and found that the because of the time dilation the clocks ran at a different rate on top of Mount Rainier than they did in Seattle by um, a few nanoseconds Looking at more detail on uh, this time dilation um, from this physicist friend, he um, he celebrated the 50th anniversary of the atomic clock and the 100th anniversary of this theory of relativity in 2005 by taking several cesium clocks on a road trip to Mount Rainier. It's a it was a family science experiment. <laughs> I used to do chemistry experiments with the kids in the backyard or take them on road cuts. This, this, this guy takes his kids up with C team clocks up the mountain. Well, he kept the clocks at an altitude for the weekend um, at, at sea level and um, was able and ran them for a while. And then he um, took the clocks up Mount Rainier and ran, ran them for a while. And um, they were 20, sec 20 nanoseconds off. It's a uh, pretty good little science experiment with the kids. So here's a close-up of the of the um, of the graph. Notice one's a little bit off. Well, that's the nature of science. You, you, no, nothing's ever right on, and uh, the blue line, for some reason. Was, was different. Well, time dilation says that the rate of time must change. Time is sped up or slowed down based on the amount of gravity or velocity of the moving objects. It's due to what Einstein called general or special relativity. This is a, a complicated graph, but it shows the amount of time gained per earth second on the left on the vertical scale and kilometers above the Earth's center on the horizontal scale. And so you can see that um, time, time changes with gravity as you get away from the Earth on that green line and um, as the uh, on the red line you'd see an orbital speed slowdown of time. Now what's interesting about this is we deal with our GPS. Your GPS would not work without time to, the rate of time changing between the, the, the satellites above the Earth and the GPS or your, your cell phone that you use. They would not work and so physicists have to recalculate the rate of time between your cell phone and the um, and the satellites that keep that cell phone accurate. So it's important to keep that in mind because uh, you're using that and therefore you're using the laws of physics the time dilation related to that. A little more detail about time in the global positioning system. Um, the current um, GPS system was developed by the U.S. Department of Defense to, buy, to provide a satellite-based navigation system for the military. Um, it was then put under joint DOD and Department of Transportation control for civilian and military use. 
and it consists of a network of 24 satellites and that may have changed in the last few years but when I looked at this 2010 that was the case um, each satellite in the GPS constellation orbits an altitude of about 20,000 kilometers from the ground and has an orbital speed of 14,000 kilometers per hour so gravity is different up there than it is on the surface of the earth and therefore the rate of time must change between those and us so um, keep in mind rates of time must change here's some time dilation videos I think that are just kind of fun and uh, just helps you to see a picture of how time dilation changes from uh, from the artist's perspective. Well, between 1860 and 1920, geologists attempted to estimate the Earth's age by how long it would take for the thickest sequences of sedimentary rocks for, to form. Um, geologists examined sequences of rocks from each geologic period, and from those, they estimated rates for the formation of these units with widely different ages from 3 million years to 15 billion years. Well, it didn't work because um, even though sedimentation rates are similar today as they were in the past, um, if, if one uses a slower or faster rate than actually occurred in the past, the age will vary. In addition, the sections used by these geologists would have been different with some more incomplete than others. In other words, there's just too much variation. Um, not quite sure what the sedimentation rate was in the past and uh, you just it's just not a good tool well numerical time gives us the ability to use unstable isotopes and find out how old the earth is um, from those unstable isotopes well an isotope in an atom um, says that atoms have the same number of protons in this case we have a um, uh, potassium that has 19 protons but you have a potassium 39 with 20 neutrons, a potassium 40 with 21 neutrons, and a potassium 41 with 22 neutrons. Earth science, rates of change. Take a look at the picture here and ask yourself, how long has this landscape looked like this? How can you tell? Will your grandchildren see this if they hike here in 80 years? What we're talking about in this um, lecture is how fast is the rate of change in various things and how do we think about that? How do we think about rate? Here's a piece of art that is uh, meant to illustrate passage of time. Snowball on the street and over time snowball melts and um, you get uh, grain, heads of grain that fall out on the street and um, basically the snowball melts. So there you go. It, how long do you think it took that, took that snowball to melt there? Well, probably depend on the temperature, but um, it was more than one day, but probably less than two weeks. Well, um, <clears throat> there's a concept known as uniformitarianism that says the processes we see now are the same kinds of processes that took place in the past. And if we have a take a picture today and or a, but a hundred years apart um, <clears throat> of the Green River, yeah, we don't see a lot of changes from over a hundred years to what we see. Um, Sandbanks maybe change, but the, the rocks formations haven't changed hardly at all. So Earth's surface changes slowly uh, in most cases, and what we'd consider slow on, on a human scale. Uh, the concept of uniformitarianism suggests that the ancient mud cracks in the lower picture um, got there in the same kind of way we get mud cracks in the, in the upper picture. So we can study modern processes and learn something about what took place in the past. You know, and that's that's true in more than geology. I mean, you can take a life event that's happening now and assume that 
those kind of life events took place in the past. We do that in Bible study. We we have family interactions today, and we assume that those same kind of family interactions took place in um, in Bible times. There's no there's not a lot of evidence for that as far as direct evidence. We have some, what Scripture teaches us, but um, um, we can assume families interacted kind of the same way I, I would when I interpret Scripture. Okay, mountains and oceans, um, they're hard to explain unless you um, put in an element of time and a rate of change that's, that's different than what we humans are used to. <clears throat> so with no rigorous scientific method, people tend to explain mountains and ocean and grand features on the earth with catastrophic events. Um, and the word catastrophism uh, definition might be the earth has been or can be affected by short duration, some duration, sometimes violent events that may be global in nature. Um, Velikovsky wrote some books that I was interested in back in high school. Velikovsky, and um, he was looking at the, the what we see on the earth from a ca catastrophic model of, on how it was made. Um, Noah's flood, flood global flood. Flood geology is another model of catastrophism. What we see comes out of just catastrophe, the global flood catastrophe. Uh, catastrophic events don't have any precedent, so they can't be explained by physical or chemical processes and are not science. There's two words around global rates of, uh, rates of change you might, might be aware of. Just two words around rates of change. High magnitude events, they're rare, affect a large area. Low magnitude events are frequent or more localized. Another exercise, I'll place each of the following events in the appropriate location in the timeline below according to either its frequency, i.e. how often, or length of time over which it occurs. So if we take each, showing the answers in red, the time between large eruptions of the same volcano is um, often a hundreds of years scale. Whereas a season is several months, like one spring is several months from the next spring. The time between great earthquakes and the San Andreas Faults is commonly hundreds of years. The period required to form the Atlantic Ocean um, would be about 200 million years. Formation and decay of a tornado would be minutes. Earth's orbit around the sun would be a year. Length of orbit for a long period comet would be hundreds to thousands of years. Time between mass extinctions of animals um, would be more than uh, 100 million years. Time required to carve out the Grand Canyon would be 1 to 5 million years. The growth of major cities, um, decades, and the formation or decay of a hurricane would be days. So this is an example of, depending on what we're talking about, depends on the kinds of rates of change that we uh, will um, experience. And it's important to think, uh, to train ourselves to think in different rates of time for different um, types of work. Radioactive decay is our clock for planet Earth. Uh, protons repel each other because they're both positive, they're all positively charged, and this repulsion is balanced by neutrons, which acts as a buffer uh, between the protons, or a buffer with the protons. But in some isotopes, the repulsion is too great, and those are unstable. All unstable isotopes may spontaneously change to more stable form through radioactive decay. Um, and radioactive decay releases energy, or heat. So when you talk when we talk about radioactive decay, we think about a parent, which is the original isotope that's unstable, and a daughter, which is a more stable isotope, which is a new a new product after the radioactive decay. Um, using our potassium atom some more, um, <clears throat> and an electron is added to a proton. The addition of that electron neutralizes the positive charge of one of the protons, changing it to a neutron. Or the loss of an electron gives one neutron a positive charge, changing it to a proton. 
So we have electrons added to protons, protons lost, neutrons gained, protons lost from a neutron, neutron lost, proton gain. Ages are calculated using radioactive decay and they tell us when minerals in a rock first solidified from molten state or formed through metamorphism. Um, this is really important to, to note. You don't get radioactive decay readings that work unless you had molten rock or to start with. In other words, the rock has to be recrystallized. The minerals in there have to be recrystallized. Um, this is really important from a young earth older standpoint because there are young earth proponents that are poo-pooing radioactive decay and saying it doesn't work, but what they're doing is measuring um, uh, debris that came out of a volcano, same Mount St. Mount St. Helens, and there was not, and the, but they're not measuring the molten magma that came out of that. So therefore, they're they're putting wrong information out there in front of the public by saying that um, the Mount St. Helens. Uh, data is is bad because the radioactive radioactive ages are vary. Well, they should vary because it's not molten magma, and uh, I wish they'd pull the publications around the Mount St. Helens stuff out of the Young Earth group because it's it's just not good science. Um, oldest rocks on Earth are four billion years old. This is when our crust began to form or solidify from a molten state. Um, and so the age of the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, and that comes from radioactive, radiometric ages of meteorites and moon rocks. Uh, some terms that are important to know when we talk about numerical time or half-life. Well, it's the time it takes for half of the parent items to convert to daughter items, and then another half for the next. And we'll get into some examples here. Isotopes have characteristic half-lives. In other words, the length of a half-life for a given isotope is always the same. So the way you could think about a half-life is you could take a sheet of paper and rip it in half. Okay, so now you have take you have you started out with a hole, and every five seconds we're going to take that half, and rip it again, and set it aside. Another five seconds, rip it again, set it aside. Five seconds, rip it again, set it aside, and so on. Rip it again, and I'll stop there. Okay, so I have a little piece of paper in my hand. So the question is, how many pieces do you have in your daughter pile after 15 seconds? Well, I have one, two, three, four, five pieces. So what's the ratio of parent to daughter after 15 seconds? Well, that's five there and one here. So it's five to one or one to five. How many pieces of daughter did you end up with? One. And what was the half-life of your fictitious isotope? Well, um, half-life was five seconds because every five seconds we ripped the piece of paper. Well, the ratio of parent isotopes to daughter atoms tells us how many half-lives has passed and therefore tells us the age. And so in this example, we have um, one half-life in the horizontal, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In other words, we're just counting half-lives there. And on the vertical scale, we have um, the, the proportion of parent to daughter isotopes. So. We start with a 100% uh, or a 100 of something. Uh, after one half-life, we have 50. Half that again. After two half-lives, we have 25. After three half-lives, half 25 is 12.5. Half of 12.5 is 6.25, and so on. At some point, it gets too small to, to even measure. And that becomes especially important when you think about carbon-14 because um, carbon-14 only works for um, recent, uh, recent material. Here's some half-lives for common radioactive isotopes. Um, notice the half-life of uranium-238 is about the same age as the Earth. Um, 
much, much longer than uh, carbon-14. Um, carbon-14 is useful for um, just recent you know, archaeology or um, recent, um, recent geology, like less than 50,000 years. And uh, uranium-235 or potassium-40 would, would both be good for dating, dating rocks and looking at um, how old the Earth is. Okay, so here's a table for solving decay problems. Um, if you start with zero, you start with 100, and you have no daughter. After one half-life, you have half of the parent and half of the daughter. You have a one-to-one -one ratio. After the second half-life, you'd have half of 50 or 25 of the parent. Um, and you'd have 75 of the daughter, and you'd have one-to-three ratio. After three half-lives, you take the uh, 25 divided by, take half of that, 12.5. Um, add that 12.5 to the 75, and you get a one-to-seven ratio. So um, half of 12.5 6.25, um, add that. You get 93.75, and now you get a 1 to 15 ratio. So you see the ratio changes um, just comparing the daughter to their parent to the daughter. So now we can put that into math formula. So sample age equals um, the number of half lives times the length of time for one of the half isotopes. It, so if you think in terms of math or think in terms of putting it in a table, you kind of can picture it either way. Um, so here's a question. Which of the isotopes listed in the chart would be most useful for dating rocks that formed shortly after the Earth formed? Well, it would be uranium-235. 238's got too long a half-life. 235 works better. Carbon-14 is way too short. It, there wouldn't be anything left after, um, you can't use it after about 50,000 years. Another question, radioactive isotopes in classic sedimentary rocks always predict an age that is older than sedimentary rock because um, the rocks in sedimentary, the, the, the pieces of the sedimentary rock came from another rock. And so those rocks um, always would date older than the actual sedimentary rock itself. Another question, the isot another question here, the, the isotope of element X has 15 protons, 17 neutrons, and 15 electrons. The element therefore has an atomic number of uh, 15 um, to 2. Atomic number of 15 and atomic mass of 32. Um, the question, if radioactive decay began with 400,000 parent isotopes, how many would be left after three half-lives? Well, first half-life down to 200,000, second half-life down to 100,000, then half of 100,000 would be 50,000. Okay. Okay, another question. The half-life of a radioactive isotope is 500 million years. Scientists testing a rock sample discover that the sample contains three times as many daughter atoms as parent atoms. What's the age of the rock? Well, we did a table a little bit ago that will be helpful with this. And I've shown it again here. Sedimentary rocks are determined to use uh, using a combination of relative time and numerical ages. Um, and we'll look at relative time in another lecture. And so here's an example of a number of sedimentary deposits. And there's igneous rocks in those sedimentary rocks, say volcanic ash. And then you can measure the um, or granite porphyry or rhyolite lava. Um, then you can measure the... Um, the uh, numerical time from the um, volcanic rocks that are embedded in the sedimentary rocks and then compare the sedimentary rocks to other sedimentary rocks 
say with the type of fossils that lived with them or something like that and then know what um, how old something is from one part of the earth to the other relative age is simply assigned by superposition and cross-cutting relationships this is kind of a fun lecture because it's it's a fairly simple concept it just gets complicated when the geology gets complicated superposition just means something is on top of something else cross-cutting relationships just mean if something cuts through something else and it's younger just a little history of relative time and by the way relative time just means is, is something younger or older than something else um, well there was a paradigm shift in the 17th century um, before the 17th century it was generally thought that the earth was was 6,000 years old or so but it's basically counting counting um, ages of people in the Bible and um, structures such as the oldest Egyptian pyramids and the Great Wall of China um, are all within a historical timeline than humans relate to but geologic events um, um, are just on a whole different time scale so um, there's a challenge regarding thinking in terms of a different different time scale so in relative time we think of which came first or second and in the example here A is underneath B so B is younger than A A had to be there so B could be deposited on top of it um, that's that's basically um, that's basically what we need to <laughs> what we're learning here um, and then in the second picture we see that the layers are tilted so the tilting would have happened to happen after the layers are put on because generally uh, rocks are laid down, rock layers, sediment layers are laid down horizontally. So if they're not horizontal, something happened to tip them. Here's another example of relative time. Um, we've got red rock units on top of tan rock units. And there is a um, an erosional area between them so what would have happened is that the the tan rocks would have been deposited horizontally and they would have been tipped and then they would have been eroded and then the red rock units um, um, deposited on top of those so principles here to think about superposition rocks at the bottom are oldest so therefore A is below uh, older than B which is older than C which is older than D cross-cutting relationships older rocks may be cut by younger rocks or features so A, B, and C are both cut but all cut by D so therefore D is younger than those three and an in inclusion younger rocks might incorporate pieces of older rocks in the 18th century um, i.e. the 1700s James Hutton watched the landscape of his farmland and invented our modern concept of geologic time um, so the observation is the landscape remained unchanged at the passage of time and the deduction would be this the same slow acting geologic processes that operate today have operated in the past meaning it takes a long time to influence the Earth's form significantly we call that uniformitarianism that doesn't mean things like NEOs don't happen catastrophes still happen but um, they're they're not the primary agent of what we see happening in um, earth history or if, if if NEOs are then part of a normal sequence like we could probably consider that those catastrophes as uniform in other words we may still get those kind of catastrophes now we just haven't seen them recently thank goodness um, another deduction might be all land should be wore down flat unless some process renews the landscape by forming new mountains cyclical change um, so I'm, I'm kind of picturing him on his farm 
thinking about the process of change over time as he as he watches his land. The problem with what he came up with is that the conclusion is that the earth must be older than 6,000 years and so thus there was a controversy between what you observe in, in uh, nature and um, what people had generally interpreted uh, the Bible to say and we still have that controversy today okay here's a crime scene um, good cross-cutting relationship example so here's the here's the the, the people that Hercule Poirot has talked to the nephew with the seeing eye dog the maid who has driven a car the cook rode a motorcycle the handyman rode a bike and the butler walked to work and so here's everybody that happened so let's let's kind of put this together and see if we can come up with which happened first second third fourth and fifth so think about that go ahead and get a sheet of paper out and kind of jot down what order you think things happened in give you a minute to do that okay So the first thing that happened is the maid drove a car because everything else is over that. Okay. Second thing that happened is the handyman rode a bike because cross-cutting relationships, the bicycle tire is over the car tire. Third thing that happened is the motorcycle Cook rode the motorcycle after the first two because the motorcycle tires go over um, the other two vehicles. Then fourth, the um, butler walked to work. Um, notice that we can tell there that the butler um, was before the seeing eye dog because the dog track is over the butler's footprint. Now, if, if the dog print was not over that, we'd, we'd have a dilemma. We couldn't tell whether the seeing eye dog or the butler was last. But because of that print, we know. So order of departure was the, handy, was the maid, the handyman, the cook, the butler, and the nephew. Looking at some real geolo geology for cross-cutting relationships. Uh, the first thing that happened in the sequence of events here is the bedrock or the uh, probably a granite was uh, deposited and, and cooled so probably knowing granite it would have been way deep under the earth and cooled then it was cut by uh, this uh, this other type of rock here and thirdly it was cracked and this crack was then filled in with probably a white silica. Unconformities are features indicating times of erosion or non-deposition. They're missing rocks. There's a disconformity, an angular unconformity, or a non-conformity as different types of unconformities. So a definition of unconformity is a feature that indicates times of erosion or non-deposition. This is a good example of a, a disconformity. So you see an erosional plane on top of uh, that would probably be some type of a limestone and then a shale on top of that. So the blue would be a limestone base. It looks like little bricks is the symbol that's normally used. And then a shale would be the, the kind of lines by the, and then a sandstone, the yellow at the bottom. By the way, those are just kind of standard symbols in the industry. But a disconformity would be that erosional surface you see there. Uh, here's an example. So you can see the arrows from one place to another. That erosional surface uh, was then covered up with another rock. And so you see one erosional surface um, 
with the pink arrow on the left and if you follow that up where the the uh, geologist is there in the, in the genes and just kind of follow that up kind of goes up across those other rocks to where the other arrow is an angular unconformity would be uh, where you have um, <clears throat> and it, say uh, in first at the beginning you have um, sediments accumulating in beds in time one and then after that happens you have some uplift and tectonic forces deform and fold those sediments so that they're they have um, um, what we call them synclines and anticlines that's what we call them but you know, they go up and they go down in synclines and anticlines and then after that it's erosion takes place and so the tops of the folded layers are eroded down and um, then in the lat finally um, subsidence the the land there may be some pressure that decreases the um, elevation of the land and it goes down and gets covered by ocean and do, get, uh, uh, layers get redeposited over the previous sediments that have been folded and you call it an angular unconformity and a simple way to remember is this the uh, the, the sedimentary rocks come up at an angle against another erosional surface Sikar Point, Scotland is a famous location for angular unconformity because when James Hutton came up with his idea of unconformatives, they went around um, the British Isles looking for examples of them. And they found this um, a great example of a, of, of a Devonian sandstone called the Devonian Old Red Sandstone, which is that above the red line, lying um, on top of almost vertical um, Silurian and it's what they call what's called gray wacky or it's a <clears throat> it's a uh, uh, clastic or a pebbly angular kind of pebbly rock that is gray in color um, so here we have a picture of James Hutton listening to our lecture in the upper right A nonconformity is an unconformity, an unconformity that exists between sedimentary rocks and metamorph metamorphic or igneous rocks. When the sedimentary rocks lie above or were deposited on pre-existing and eroding metamorphic or igneous rocks. So here's an example where you have an intrusion of magma, and it's bright red, but um, that gets uplifted from the lower left to the middle left and everything's eroded down to the mag to the to the uh, rock that's cooled from the magma so it was red representing liquid magma now it's cooled so it's orange but that's an igneous rock and then for some reason it's um, it's it's down lifted it's it's and uh, sedimentary rocks are deposited back on top of it and that that uh, line that between the igneous and the uh, sedimentary rocks would be called a nonconformity. Here's an example of a nonconformity. You have um, igneous rocks in the bottom, and you can see it's been cut by another uh, line of igneous rocks. It just stops. And then above that, where that arrow is pointing, is a sedimentary rock that's been deposited on top of it. So that's a nonconformity. When you have sedimentary rocks and magma um, gets injected into those sedimentary rocks, then pieces of the sedimentary rocks can break off and or be melted in that into that magma. And so here, here we see that being the case. And then after it all cools, then you might get erosion down to where the line shows you um, at the erosion level. Well, then if you're walking along that and and look what's along that line, you see a nonconformity where you have the sediments um, on top of the igneous magma, but then you get another sediment. And oh gee, why is the sediment under there? Well, uh, it's because it 
it broke off and fell down in the liquid magma. So it's really important to think about all the different ways this could happen. Another principle that's helpful in telling relative age is correlation of volcanic ash over great distances. Um, I was married in 1980. In 1980, Mount, Hel Mount St. Helens blew up. And one of the things that, that we had was a layer of volcanic ash spread all the way from, from the um, west coast. And I got married in Kansas, and it, I remember we had a layer of, just a very thin layer of ash, even as far east as Kansas. Well, we can see those type of, um, of um, ash correlations in the ge geologic record. So here we have an example of two ash, two ash layers, one in, a, um, in Siberia, another one in Alaska, both coming from the same volcanic event. Uh, so we can correlate events in time. Um, this type of uh, cross um, um, this type of couple of questions about relative time just to just to check we've got a picture here and we've got labels on different layers so which statement is the most accurate is D older than B well D is above B and they're both sediments so that doesn't make sense is E older than A well, E is underneath A, so it is older, and there's an angular unconformity between E and A, too. If you can see the layers of E pinching out against layer A. And F is older than C. Does that make sense? No, it looks like F and C um, are the same layer because you have that red horizontal layer um, going across all the way from F on the right to C on the left. And there we are. The question, when did the tilting of the layers occur? Well, it was it had to have been before A was deposited because A is horizontally over E and the other layers. Um, between deposition of E and A, that makes sense. And before B was deposited, um, no, it couldn't have been before that because E's way to, B's way down at the bottom. And between deposition of layers C and E, that doesn't make sense because E is hor is um, the same angle of uh, tilting that C is. So B is the best answer. Another useful tool in telling rel relative age is biostratigraphy or the use of index fossils. And index fossils are really helpful in the oil business because you can use fossils to tell whether um, something is the same age or not. Um, little tiny fossils will show up in the cuttings of the oil from that come out with when you drill the oil when you when you cut through the rock. And there's a whole science of identifying what those little fossils are, so that you can. Um, you can know what type of rock you're looking at underground. Um, so in this case, you had time inter you have time intervals over which species existed A, B, and C in the first area, and then you can see that C and B exist in the second area, but A is missing. Well, based on principal superposition, you know that A lived after B. So, um, therefore, the rock that C is in um, must have had A in, the, in between there. It just wasn't deposited, probably, um, in the second area. So, here's an example of the use of index fossils. We have some just uh, examples of fossils here in three different uh, road cuts or three different um, drill um, wells. And... When you when you match the layers up, um, you get something like this because um, the index fossils 
it shows you that they were deposited about the same time. And so the, when you when you when you put all the data together, you get a um, a layering of what's younger than something else that looks like what you see on the right. In other words, we're looking at relative time, what's younger than what's some what's younger than something else. One of the things that's really important to remember from history is that the fossils were indexed before the old 4.5 billion year age of the Earth um, was found. Often you'll see in young Earth literature just the opposite, but that doesn't fit the history of the situation. What happened is that um, those interested in the ge geologic sciences found the fossils and used those as index fossils to then um, identify what the periods of time were based on those fossils and called them. Uh, so most of those are different places in England, but some, some are in Russia. So for example, the uh, Permian period was named after Perm, Russia in 1841. The Devonian was named after Devonshire in England. The Ordovician is named after uh, Wales, placed in Wales in Western England. Carboniferous uh, came out of, um, was identified from uh, sedimentary layers in North Central England. These fossils were matched up and very carefully used with all kinds of good arguments between geologists in the 1800s to decide what uh, what uh, these periods would be called and which rocks went with which period. None of these were actually a dated as far as how old they were. It was just uh, dated on which ones were older than which other ones. In other words, relative time. That's really important because it's just not true that uh, geologists have used the fossil record as a way to um, historically prove evolution. It's actually the opposite where the fossil record was used to describe um, the order of what we see in the fossil record and um, And so if, if we look at the different periods again here, we see that these periods were determined all before Darwin published his Origin of the Species. In other words, Origin of the Species came out after the fossil record was put into place and the relative ages of what we call the geologic column uh, was was set not after but before Origin of the Species was written. Okay, let's look at the Grand Canyon as an example of relative time. Rocks at the base are older than rocks at the top by superposition. So if you look at the lowest units, you see that there's granite and schist, which uh, Vishnu schist or a schist is a, a metamorphic rock and um, granite is an igneous rock. Um, the uh, metamorphic and igneous rocks here are thought to be the roots of an ancient mountain chain or volcanic arc and they got exposed to the surface by erosion. There was uplift and when the when the rocks were uplifted um, over time they got eroded down. We can use the Grand Canyon as an example of geologic history. And so if I look on the left side at one sedimentation and burial, you had sediments that were um, that were um, deposited and then buried. And then two, those sediments were uplifted and, and mountains were built. And if I go to the left side, number three, those sediments were all um, were all uh, 
removed. They were eroded away. And then number four, there were more sediments deposited on top of, of those mountain, those roots of mountains. Then on the right side, um, there was uplift and erosion. So those sediments and that intruded and the, those mountain roots were uplifted and then eroded. And then there was de deposition put on top of that. And then number seven, uh, there was more uplift and there were erosional cuts that created the Grand Canyon. Then after that Grand Canyon was cut, then there was volcanism, number eight, that took place at the very end. And there's still uplift going on. So the, the, the Grand Canyon is still being cut as we speak, although at a time scale, you know, a rate of time that we, we really can't observe as humans. Okay, um, how can we tell that the volcanism is younger than the formation of the sedimentary rocks? Again, we're looking at the Grand Canyon as an example. Well, because the volca volcanoes, and here's a cinder cone, uh, they spill over the sedimentary rocks. They've cut the, 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 the materials cut through the sedimentary, sedimentary rocks, and then the lava and ash has been deposited on top of it. Index fossils are very useful for um, telling us uh, which sediments are younger or older than other sediments. And again, like I said earlier, that's really important in being able to go from one place to another and understand how the sediments were deposited, and then that can help tell us whether or not, um, for example, we, we could find it, it might find oil there because the, the type of rock is a specific kind of rock that helps, that is um, the kind of rock that oil would be formed from. So the, it's very useful to um, understand relative time which sediments are, are older or younger than other sediments. So an index fossil is useful if it's found over a large geographical area but only lived for a very short period of time. So if I look at these fossils, I have three fossils, one, two, and three. Which ones of these would be best for index fossils? Well, let's look here. If I look at the um, amino aminoid um, on these four layers, I find it in the northwest, the east, but I don't find it in the south. So geographically, it's not as, as good as maybe another one. If I look at um, fossil 2 and, and also also the uh, aminoid is found way in top and way bottom so it's it, it's not geographically it might be okay but it's 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 it lived for a long time fossil 2 I only find in one layer in north one layer in west and one layer in south so that might be a pretty good index fossil because it's um, it's not found in multiple layers up and down. And the fossil three looks like it's a little um, a little brachiopod or a pelosopod. Um, it, it looks like it's not as useful either because like in the east it's found in the bottom layer and close to the top layer. So we're going to pick fossil two as our best fossil. The fossils we find in the Grand Canyon support the geologic interpretations of, of what is there. So, for example, uh, in B, we know trilobites lived under the ocean, so therefore the, the, the um, environment that that rock would have had been deposited in would have had to been under the ocean. Same with D, crinoids. But G, you see there's a leaf there. And so that leaf would have not been under the ocean, would have been terrestrial. Um, in H, there's a trace fossil there. Well, a trace fossil would probably have been like in mud or something, or a worm track or something. So that tells us that um, it would have been very shallow. Here's a um, list of the formations and where you find them in the Grand Canyon, a section of the Grand Canyon. 
And if we split that out into the, over the geologic time period, you can see that there was a late Proterozoic um, deposition and mountain building. And then there was an unconformity. Then there was another late Proterozoic um, time, time of deposition, mountain building, unconformity. And then you have a Cambrian deposition and then unconformity, in other words, mostly erosion. And then a Devonian deposition, then an unconformity. And a Mississippian and Pennsylvanian um, deposition with an unconformity in between them. And then a uh, unconformity and then a Permian deposition. And then that's, that's where it ends. The top of the Grand Canyon is Permian in age. So we're able to explain what we find in the Grand Canyon by, um, by um, uh, using relative, relative time scale. Now this doesn't say how old it is at all, but we do know that it could not have been deposited by one big catastrophe because of the complexity of what we find there, including if you look at the Mississippian there's a limestone there. Well, a limestone is on top of that Cambrian shale with unconformities in between. Well, you can't have limestone deposited in um, a catastrophe like um, a flood geologist would say.